Um, and so this session is on applications and time scales. And Desiree Tamazi is going to start. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here to start off this session. And so we're going to start looking at some applications of uh, forecast information at different time scales to support fisheries management in a changing ocean. So I'm Desiree Tomasi. I'm at the NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center, also affiliated with the University of California, Santa Cruz. And uh, I just want to acknowledge my many collaborators that uh, you'll see their names in the slides and references to their papers. So I just want to make sure that you go on and check out those, those references that I'm going to be speaking of. So Mike put up these figures, but I just want to stress that fisheries decisions across timescapes are impacted by climate effects. And that is because we know climate affects you know, vital processes of uh, living marine resources as well as their distribution. And then this leads to these processes that I've highlighted here in the clouds, the climate processes, affecting a lot of the decisions that are being taken. And those decisions are taken at a variety of scales. And I've highlighted some of those in those colorful uh, cloud uh, blobs there, as well as a more specific one on, on the side. Oh, now it's not moving. And uh, in talking to stakeholders, and actually I looked at a poll that was taken of stakeholders on the West Coast that are engaged with the Fisheries Management Council process as a, in advisory bodies. And it was clear that there is a need for climate ready, what we call climate ready fisheries management, or information that uh, might give you a foresight of what species of interest to the council will be doing um, you know, one month from now to on the century scale. And those relate to decisions that are taken during the fishing season. So we call those in-season fishing decisions to, you know, the famous stock assessment or setting the catch limits. And that's usually taken at an annual or a biannual scale. And then there are also longer term strategic issues of do we need to change our current management um, or our risk control rule because it's not robust to, uh, projected changes in uh, species by the rates or distribution under climate change. And so you use uh, different models and different approaches when you're looking at these sort of uh, different um, decisions. And today for this talk, I'm going to really be focusing on sort of the yellow and green boxes and not so much on the strategic decisions and the century scale uh, timeframe. So going back to this first slide, I'm going to present application from this pink plot all the way to the green one. And I kind of color coded my slides so you can sort of follow along in terms of the time scale. So I'm not going to spend too much time here because the speakers after me can talk way more eloquently than I can on this. But I just wanted to let you know that outside of North Fisheries, the NOAA National Ocean Service actually have a NOAA ecological forecasting group, and they're looking at uh, you know forecasts on the near real time to a really the short time scale, so up to five days outlooks for some of these, and these are related to harmful algal blooms, coastal pathogen forecast, hypoxia forecast, and coral bleaching forecast. And I'm not going to talk about this today, but in terms of coral bleaching, they're also uh, they have developed experimental seasonal forecasts for those. On the fishery side, we have a few near real time or now cast, uh, like the EcoCast tool that Mike was speaking to this, of this morning. And so these are dynamic, dynamic ocean management tools that are developed to reduce bycatch. So you have now cast of ocean conditions, and initially those were taken from actually satellites. Now, uh, they're also taken from uh, regional ocean models, but then are linked to species distribution models. And these species distribution models are often just, they are statistical models making the physics to uh, the distribution of a species of interest. And uh, 
they are often developed using uh, machine learning methods. And then uh, in this case, Ecocast uses species distribution model of a target species, like swordfish, as well as a few of the bycatch species that are of interest to you know, the council because they want to protect these resources. And these are loggerhead turtles, sea lions, and, and also they're including sharks. And so you see here on the left, uh, and then this product is freely available on, on the web, and fishers can go look at the map when they're deciding where to fish, and they're saying, okay, maybe I should avoid these red areas because there is an increased risk of bycatch. Now, nobody has actually uh, sort of kind of followed up to see is this actually being used or not, but they're definitely tracking the amount of bycatch in this uh, fishery. And so that's work that's done by Elio Azen at the ERD lab, uh, in the ERD group in the, uh, the Southwest Fishery Science Center. And that same group has also developed uh, Whale Watch, which is uh, uh, similar, but it's looking at producing maps of uh, whale distribution. And for the current month, in this case, so you can see the scale over here, but now they're updating it, if you look at the Abrams et al. paper, to being a, a daily now cast of whale distribution on a 10 by 10 kilometer scale. And again, this is to reduce human impacts on whale, in particular ship strikes, but it could be useful also to reduce whale entanglements with fishing gear. And then out in Hawaii, they have another similar pro uh, product, it's called Turtle Watch, and this is simpler in terms of the variables, physical variables that are ingested into this product, it's really looking at the preferred sort of thermal habitat of sea turtles. And so again, this one ingests satellite uh, information, or really just SSD, and produces this map. And you see this area kind of enveloped, enveloping 63 Fahrenheit up to 65.5 Fahrenheit that shows the preferred habitat for the sea turtles. And then again, this uh, sword fishing uh, vessel, a uh, note to avoid long liners, avoid those, uh, those areas because of increased bycatch risk. Uh, then another way that the species distribution model can be used and are actually being used is to optimize survey coverage. This is actually happening on, uh, on the West Coast. So we have two cruises going out every year that are the coastal pelagic surveys. And especially the one in spring is aimed at uh, uh, sampling the sardine spawning habitat. And so uh, Juan Zwolinski and Dave Timmer at the Southwest Fishery Science Center have developed a species distribution while well, a spawning habitat model for sardine. And every time the crews go out uh, in real time, they look at the map of the potential habitat to ensure that they sample the entire habitat. And so I wanted to also, uh, I guess, give you guys a list of the environmental inputs that are going into the species distribution model. So as I said, some can be very simple, like the sea turtle, uh, turtle watch product and just include sea surface temperatures, but they often include, the, in the case of EcoCast, other variables and like sea surface height, adikinetic energy, something about the surface winds, and chlorophyll A is often very important and even subsurface variables like isothermal layer depth or the bulk ground by frequency. So now we are moving to a different time scale and uh, looking at the seasonal time scale. And so some of these approaches in terms of the biological models, so the species distribution models, have also been used on the seasonal scale. And uh, way back in 2011, Alistair Opde, that really pioneered this approach uh, using seasonal forecast uh, for fisheries applications, uh, has this um, product, uh, this is now in Australia, we are changing continents, where it's linking the a seasonal prediction system, so this is a dynamical seasonal prediction system, and uh, taking just SSD from that, SSD anomalies, and then adding those to a climatology, because I guess as we were discussing before, they don't, um, the habitat model really ingests the, the full temperature, not the anom anomalies in the way that they're constructed. 
and uh, and then that informs uh, a southern bluefin tuna habitat under a forecast that is stiff for uh, up to a four month lead time. And that leads to improved operational decisions in terms of the fishermen. They can take a look at the forecast and say, okay, maybe my effort should be spent fishing further north because uh, it seems that this year uh, the zone of uh, kind of the buffer zone and then the core zone is moving northward, so I'm going to have to fish even further north. And uh, on the west coast, uh, Stephanie Brody, Brody at ERD has looked at sort of potential predictive skills. So this is kind of an idealized uh, model in the sense that she was not using a forecast as sort of perfect information in terms of the physics. physics. And she looked at, uh, you know, what's the predictive skill of swordfish catch anomalies. So if you remember, swordfish was the model that uh, was part of EcoCast. And uh, uh, an interesting that, that she did is that when she was looking at um, a summarizing prediction skill, she looked at it at different resolution from 0 0.5 degrees all the way to the entire core fishing area for swordfish. And she also decomposed the environmental signal that went in, uh, into the species distribution model from just, you know, the climatology, which is the purple line, the yellow line, which is the climatology plus the low frequency signal, and then adding on top of that the daily fields. And here we are look, looking at the upper percentile accuracy, so more of a probabilistic metric. And the dot, dotted line is just your random forecast. You can see that maybe for some months there might be some skill, you know, above just a random forecast. So there is. Um, some suggestion that maybe there is potential for a skillful seasonal forecast of swordfish. And I guess what she found was that the low frequency component was the dominant source of predictive skills. So you can see that adding the daily field doesn't add much. And you can also see that uh, if you're averaging over a larger area, then your skill, uh, you can see here, is increased in some months. And the environmental inputs here were SSD, chlorophyll A, and IND. And then again on the west coast, and Sam will speak more to the J-scope uh, uh, downscaling model, but they've actually produced a, oops, a Hake distribution forecast. And so I think the, there is a global uh, seasonal forecast system that fits in into the J-scope uh, RAMS model that downscales it. And then this produces uh, the temperature at the depth that it's important for this fish species, so this is eight, so it's not surface temperature, but at 20, 250 meters uh, deep, and that fits into the habitat model, and uh, it looked at the scale at, of an eight-month lead time forecast. They didn't have a lot of years to do uh, out of sample validation of uh, this forecast, but it seemed pro promising, and so they are providing these maps uh, on the JSCOPE website and the hope is that this would improve survey planning sort of like this are being but at the seasonal time scale and also could give an early warning of ecological shifts because the hake is a prime uh, well it's a predator on the west coast and so it would be interesting to know uh, of changes in their distributions for the managers and uh, there's not a lot of work, work that has been done at the multi-annual forecast scale, especially in the US, but in terms of stakeholders, I think that would be useful for survey planning, also avoiding international conflicts of the fishing rights, if you're look, thinking about distribution. At dinner, I can talk to you all about the macro wars in Europe, uh, and also obviously helping the stakeholder plan for changing fishing opportunities or for changing interactions. And uh, uh, on uh, this one is work that has been done in Europe, where they produce multi-annual forecasts of suitable blue whiting spawning habitat. And uh, uh, they're actually a big driver. They tried both salinity and SSD, but really uh, the driver in terms of the predictability was salinity. And that's because the low frequency dynamics of the North Atlantic subpolar gyres uh, give quite a long well, are a good source of predictive skill at this uh, 
multi-annual scale. And uh, they produce the, so this is a metric of uh, forecast scale. And uh, just the three colors here, the blue is a, is a model of uh, uh, blue whiting habitat where the input in terms of salinity comes from a dynamical model. And then uh, the other two are sort of persistent product, just uh, different, uh, different persistent product. Uh, and you can see that at least for the one year to two year scale, there is some additional scale brought up on by the, by the dynamical model. But persistence does pretty well in this case. And this is the speed of the biological forecast, just driven by these three different products. Um, and now we're going to go to forecast of stock abundance of biomass. So we've been talking a lot about distribution. But uh, what uh, stock assessment folks uh, do a lot of is producing this forecast, you know, one year out, maybe three year out of what the stock biomass will be. And that is the basis of uh, then their catch limits. For some species, like North Pacific tunas, you actually do 10 year projection into the future. And that also informs catch advice. And just a little bit about all the sort of sources, potential sources of uh, maybe a predictability well, in those just from the biological side of things. But initial conditions, uh, you can think of this as biological persistence, are, uh, are very important to you know, giving you some scale in this forecast. That's because you know, how many fish you have today is going to be an important determinant of how many fish you're going, you will know, have next year. So the age structure and the biomass at age and these are all done with population dynamics model that, that really take advantage of, of the age structure of the stock. And then obviously, uh, productivity also matter. And so what recruitment is going to be, mortality, as well as growth. But then also fishing. So if uh, the stock is fished really hard, fishing will obviously determine how much the biomass uh, next year. And so that's also related to selectivity. And actually, I wanted to stress that uh, fishery scientists call these projections because it really depends on the fishing mortality scenario that you're using. And they often compare different mortality scenario to see, OK, even this condition. If we use this fishing mortality, what's going to happen to the stock? What's going to happen if we use another one? And then they could pick an optimal one. And, uh, and so here, uh, just thinking about how the life history of each species is going to contribute to this biological persistence. So uh, here is the lead time in years. And this is something that, uh, you know, like a conceptual uh, plot that we put together. But a uh, shark, a short fin maker shark, for instance, has a, a lower mortality than a sardine. And so uh, the initial. Uh, conditions are going to contribute for longer to prediction scale than, than for a certain. And then again, this is contribution of fishing mortality, but actually knowing what the catch is is going to give you a lot of information about what the biomass is. And this is just a plot that sometimes is done in stock assessment to see you know, how good is the stock assessment, do you understand the relationship between uh, fishing and the productivity of the stock, and for Pacific bluefin tuna, who's uh, she's been fished down quite a bit, so uh, now we have less than 10% of the spawning stock biomass in an unfished state. Uh, this is a working paper that we only put together from the Southwest Fishery Science Center, uh, but just showing that if you uh, are over here, let's say in 2008, and you uh, generate just a forecast of what the biomass will be you know, 10 years from now, or, or from year 1 to 10. And uh, you're keeping all the parameters to sort of their mean conditions, so even recruitment, just the mean stock recruitment relationship. But you do all the catch. And then again, we don't have any observation of uh, fish biomass, but we have these uh, CPU indices. And then from that biomass uh, model, you derive, again, the CPU index. And you have the actual CPU you index here, which is uh, in these, uh, these dots, you can see that you know, there is some skill. It's obviously not perfect, but you get the tick in the biomass, which was brought on by just reduced uh, fishing pressure. 
And then just, uh, I wanted to let you know a little bit about how uh, these projections are done. And uh, recruitment is generally sampled from the historical distribution. So you, you know you have random variability in recruitment and generally other parameters like mortality or growth are kept constant. And so I looked at, okay, what if uh, you actually could, uh, would have an idea of what, instead of just having random recruitment, a seasonal forecast, if you have a strong relationship between recruitment and an environmental variable, could give you an, an inkling of uh, you know, what the future recruitment is going to go. So uh, in my paper, I look at sardine and the relationship that is used in the risk control rule with, between sardine recruitment and temperature. And basing catch advice on that forecast of biomass informed by a recruitment format, forecast informed by a seasonal SSD forecast is better than the status quo. And, uh, and so, and how you, what do you mean is better? Is better in terms of the management objectives that are important to, to the managers, like biomass or catch. But I want to stress that the results are really time dependent. And so the forecast stackers was accuracy in terms of the SSD was too low to be useful in leads of five months or greater. And so just concluding with sort of some future needs, and uh, this speaks to the sardine example because now we are revisiting this SSD relationship and expanding on it, but there is a need for strong mechanistic understanding of this environment fisheries relationship, especially if you're using statistical models, and so there has to be an iterative cycle where you keep checking that these statistical relationships are holding. Uh, focus on what is use, useful, and so I guess then I need to stress that co-development with end users is key, and to figure out what the appropriate spatial scales are for the processes of interest, and as well as what the variables of interest might be. And then just improve accessibility and delivery of forecast output. It's really hard for a fishery scientist, of course, to access the NMME and downloading all the, all the data from there. Skills assessment, uh, we've seen uh, you know, with some of Mike's work of variables other than SST, but also of the actual ecological forecast. There has to be more of that that is done. And long retrospective forecast to actually test the, the reliability and long range analysis for training. That's it. I was wondering if you could comment on how that you've had some a collective experience with a number of stock. How much, what's the, what's the partitioning do you feel between sort of the natural memory and the, and the life cycle of the fish and, and those environmental signals? Um, you know, you have that kind of idealized picture from, from the paper with Mike. Um, you know, what's the rough numbers on it based on your experience? What, what have you been finding? Uh, so I haven't, I would like to look into that more. Just, yeah, maybe you can get a postdoc to do that. But yeah, so definitely for, it, it all depends on the life cycle. So if you're a ground fish, you're gonna have a lot of that skill. You know, so maybe a seasonal forecast of temperature, or oh, well, actually as a stage, for instance, maybe border for some of the species uh, or bottom temperature is not gonna really provide you much more than what the biology is providing. I think for something like squid that is, you know, faster lead species, that's very different, or maybe sardine is there in between. And, uh, but then that's different, of course, if you're moving more at the interannual time scales. So then that's why I guess multi-annual forecasts are important in this case, because there is a lot in terms of the seasonal forecast skill that you can get from the biology itself. I could ask one more. <laughs> uh, so uh, I was also curious, uh, what is your sense of um, your, your optimism or, 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 or not of, of, of how much traction these sort of environmentally informed um, anticipatory uh, approaches have been getting uh, 
in terms of making it to the decision making process? Yeah, so I don't think we have, uh, we're discussing in our little discussion group, so how many of these have actually influenced uh, real decisions, right? And there are, I couldn't really think of many examples. I mean, the Nowcast, maybe with the, the sardine survey, right, one, and Ecocast, uh, maybe if the fishers are actually looking at them. But in terms of the sardine, I think now with the downscale seasonal forecast, we might have a longer lead time, but uh, just the four month was not enough, really in terms of the, of the process, like the stock assessment pro process, you need a lead time of at least six months or longer for that to even start getting incorporated into that process, which we didn't have at that time, but we are also revisiting the SST, you know, sardine relationship. So, uh, yeah, I think there needs to be a lot more work just spent talking to the council and to the people, but so you need dedicated people to be able to do that. And also, um, I think just even doing more work with the stock assessment scientists themselves. And I think they're open, but it just there is a high bar to, to cross. Like you have to show that it's a better model than what they're currently using than just the random forecast. Sorry, I think we should probably move on, but hold the thought, please. <laughs> um, that, that was actually really great. So please, let's have some more discussion on this. I think it's super exciting to see these longer time scale um, popping out in the fisheries. And so um, now we have Sam Sidlecki who's going to talk about hypoxic conditions, or predicting hypoxia. Oh, it's your slide. I was like, that's Okay. Okay. Um, oh. Can you guys hear me okay? Wonderful. Um, so I'm Samantha Sedlecki. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Connecticut, and I'm going to talk to you about work that I started um, on during my postdoc at UW um, at what is now called Seacoast, but was formerly known as Jaseo. And, um, and primarily what led into um, this, this uh, prediction system um, called JSCOPE, which is um, Jaseo's Seasonal Coastal Ocean Prediction of the Ecosystem. Um, there's been conversation about changing the J um, over because it's now Seacoast. But in any case, um, we talk about uh, seasonal forecast of ocean health is primarily what I'm going to be talking about today. And this is, of course, work like has been um, pointed out previously with lots of, with a large team. Let's see if that one will work. Um, and the kind of group that has been on multiple uh, different, so like the core JSCOPE team that's been involved on multiple different applications um, is, uh, is, is really talked about here. Um, that's uh, Isaac and Al, Nick, and Al's online, I think. Um, Simone maybe as well. Emily is um, going to be talking during the, has a poster here, and I'll, and I'll show some of her work in a sec. Um, but there are many others, and I'll get to those other collaborators on the specific applications as we go through them. So we can't talk about today without showing Desiree's slide. Um, so in, ca in keeping with that theme, um, I, I decided to put this as my opener. Uh, there's some specific things that are a little bit different than what other folks have said. Of course, I agree with everything else that's been pointed out about this slide. Um, but in particular, that the forecasts um, are on the on times on whatever time scale you're looking for have to be tailored to the particular stakeholders' needs. And that each each of those stakeholders and managers requires um, specific variables or indices or outputs to make and support their decision. Um, and in our experience, it's important to test the model performance specifically on uh, targeting those variables in order to build trust with those stakeholders. I'll talk a little bit about that. And of course, there can be um, societal benefits if the model has skill, in, you know, in those performances. So um, the forecast system, JScope, you can find out more about us on the, uh, we're hosted on the regional IUS portal, NANUS, um, and so there's the web link up there. Um, so how, you, how we built the model, it's um, downscaled from the global coupled simulation called uh, the climate forecast system, and that is very coarse resolution, and so we downscale that uh, with the UW uh, Cascadia configuration, which has higher resolution, 
and has um, now all the way up through carbon chemistry. Um, and then that dynamical model is then, um, you know, taken to these habitat models, uh, or, you know, ingested into habitat models, um, like the ones that were just, Desiree was just pointing out. Um, and so there's uh, been applications for sardine, for hake, um, juvenile crab, and an adult crab paper, paper that's in the works that um, Emily's poster is about, and I'm sure she'll talk more about um, during her highlight later. So here's um, kind of what the website looks like if you were to go there. Um, I pointed out for a couple of things. Um, one is that um, the forecasts have been up there, two forecasts since our first one was January initialized in 2013. So we're coming up on our 10 year anniversary of doing the, putting these ocean forecasts up on the web. Um, each of those years you can go back and look at and there's um, like below the, um, the times, you can see like the different pages that we produce with output, um, you know, specific for, um, with, specific, with specific stakeholders in mind for each one of those forecast years. Um, and then there's all sorts of other information there on the side, um, which I'll refer to more in a sec. Um, oh, and the other thing is that we are, um, which says here is that we um, are all, the, all these products then are delivered to the um, Pacific Fishery Management Council each spring as part of the um, ecosystem status report. Okay. So um, the performance testing with stakeholders in mind, using the data they trust is like something that we have uh, focused on over the years. And so um, this is a map uh, just showing you like all the observations that we have used in order to do that. Um, and, uh, and what I mean by performance is kind of like the ability um, to produce the, the like seasonal trends in the region. Um, and we compare the observed and simulated climatologies, climatologies or historical conditions, as it were. Um, and so when we work with the OAA cruise planning, we definitely use their uh, the comparisons to the West Coast Ocean Acidification, uh, you know, historical cruise line. Um, when we work with the ground fish fishery, we definitely work with um, like all the small dots there in the background, this like the ground fish trawl, um, you know, comparisons to their benthic data. When we work with um, the Pacific Fisheries Management Council in that ecosystem status report, it's always the 25 meter you know, aragonite saturation state from Newport line, right? And so, um, you know, these are observations that those groups have been looking at and that we make, make sure to make comparisons to um, in a direct way. Um, so, for example, for carbon, this is an example of, um, you know, over many years now, like the historical comparisons and they're all grouped together, but that we do a pretty good job historically with DIC, although there's room for improvement. With the coastal tribes, we've also worked to connect. Um, and so this figure, it should say, it does have a, from PMEL and uh, Simona Lynn working with the Center for Environmental Visual Visualization, you can get that bird's eye view of the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. And those triangles there are moorings that are just off the coast um, of, uh, of the uh, tribal communities there uh, located nearby. Um, and though they rely on, they look at those, that information, they, you know, look at the moorings. And so it is um, essential for us to make comparisons um, in working with them. So we did that in 2016, with both the climatology as well as um, from the observations from those moorings. Um, this one happens to be off Cape Elizabeth in 42 meters of water for um, surface and bottom fields, including the biogeochemistry. Um, in terms of uncertainty, I swear I had this slide in here before <laughs> the conversation this morning, um, but we have a mini ensemble, which is just only one measure, all right, of all the aspects of uncertainty that were talked about earlier. Um, and so, again, one way of conveying that information, because the stakeholders are used to looking at Cape Elizabeth, you know, regularly, and they know and have this intuition about when hypoxia develops and, you know, from looking at the observations year after year, and they're out there on those waters, right? Um, right there, um, we uh, provide on the website like a, um, on the, what our little ensemble looks like for those particular locations. Um, so it's a forecast at that mooring location and the timing of when hypoxia occurs is uh, for each one of the ensemble members as well as the climatological average are shown in the dotted lines there so that we can um, 
how I convey whether or not it's likely to be earlier or later in that location for hypoxia to develop. In terms of our um, own going, going back and kind of evaluating, we find that the January forecast tend to predict the um, hypoxia in this location about 10 days earlier than observed, um, and that the April does it about a day later than observed um, over the many years that we've done this so far. And so that's another way that we can um, kind of like bring in our like confidence in the model to uncertainty conveyance with the stakeholders. Um, so uh, the PFMC materials that we've been that we deliver every March include uh, the Hague forecast that was talked about by Desiree. That then um, it also includes um, this is particularly the January 2021 forecast for aragonite saturation state um, along at the bottom. And um, it's not delivered as an anomaly because that's not what they want. They wanted the actual fields to look at where the threshold of one is, you know, um, on the bottom. And, um, and then we write up a little blurb like what you see on the side there um, with some explanation about it. Um, and you can also find the product on our website. We also provide similarly something like that for hypoxia. So um, we do continued evaluation and trust building through a year in review exercise. So it's all well and good to put the forecasts out there, but then how did they do? Um, and so on the tab on the left, you can click on year in review and look and see at that same mooring location. This is I'm following through the example, but there's other locations that are on there, kind of what happened observationally and what the model did. Now you can see that the model has a tendency to get anoxic. Um, especially in the forecast by the end of the summer. And that's um, like a known weakness that we write about in there as well. Um, you know, coming back to the theme this morning about some of the atmospheric products that would be great to have. Um, the end of the upwelling season is very difficult to forecast on these timescales. And so um, without, and so the, that fall transition, which happens very abruptly in the Pacific Northwest, as anyone who lives there, can tell you that summer ends like that, and also there's a storm system that moves in, and that flushes the oxygen out um, very readily. And, and you know, if we don't, and we don't capture that well in uh, our forecast, so we also have a disclaimer about that known bias in the model, um, in the forecast themselves, like on the website. Um, so predictability is a different skill measure that was brought up this morning in Mike's uh, Jaycox talk, um, and. Stakeholders want to know not just know that not just understand that we can show that the work the product works forecasts work, but that we know why. Um, that also helps to build their confidence in the product. Um, so we do explore this as well. Um, so you can this is a one from that 2016 paper showing where we showed the anomaly correlation coefficient you know plotted spatially. Um, this is a um, sea surface temperature, bottom temperature, and bottom oxygen. And what the main finding here was that the surface <coughs> fields do better, right, than the surface fields. But now we've gone back to 1998 and um, separated them by ENSO um, uh, conditions. And I added now a bottom aragonite saturation state because um, we have that now, which we didn't in 2016. What's interesting is that um, subsurface still remains skillful. You can see bottom temperature, but that bottom aragonite doesn't really seem to be doing well during strong ENSO events. Um, but if we look at the neutral conditions, they look much better. Um, so bottom temperature remains strong in both states, but um, aragonite saturation state looks better in, uh, is more skillful in terms of this predictability measure um, uh, in neutral conditions. Um, so this is new and something that I'm still chewing on, and I'd love to talk to you all more about this. Um, I have some ideas in the next couple slides. Just to clarify, though, um, this is from the long run from 1998 through 2017. The N has come up before uh, in some of our discussions. There's only six of these for the neutral conditions. And, um, and this is ACC of the January forecast in the summer upwelling months. So this is at the tail end of our um, predictive, you know, this is like a five to eight month uh, time period. So it is a very difficult and, you know, the points about the spatial averaging uh, and temporal averaging that were made in prior talks are also real, right? So this, this is a very hard test, what I'm, what I'm showing you uh, now, anyway. There's ideas about why that might be. So Slagna um, is here, and this looks like it got cut off. Sorry about that, um, the words there, but I'll just tell you that, um, and she'll tell you more about it later on her poster. Um, she's talking about a paper that she has in review now, where she analyzed uh, CFS 
Um, and one of the things that she found was that um, the summer uh, subsurface temperatures were highly correlated to the subsurface temperatures from the winter prior. And so what you're looking at here is that correlation between those two time periods um, along 26.4 from the CFSR reanalysis. And the first panel shows you all years and then broken up into ENSO and ENSO neutral. And this particular analysis goes back to the 70s, so further back than we did with our downscaled experiments. Um, and you can see that the ENSO neutral years have much higher correlation there for bottom temperatures um, between that subsurface and the winter prior. Um, you know, that's stronger. Even though the correlation exists in both you know, ENSO and neutral, it's stronger in the neutral um, states, which is interesting. And um, points to that reemergence um, idea that um, Mike Alexander talked about this morning. Um, and she has some ideas about the role of that versus advection between those different states that she'll explore in her poster. So you should check that out. So we um, worked on taking this to the crab fishery because um, that there are subsurface conditions at benthic habitat was um, you know, something that we found was had more skill and the variables of interest to the crab fishery. So we had a project funded by, um, uh, by NOAA MAP, uh, the NOAA MAP program uh, with, with the, our advisory council included the regional managers, uh, um, including um, the, the tribal nation. And of course, Dungeness is important because it's an economic powerhouse, um, but it's also culturally important to the tribes um, as well. And, um, and then just, you know, the, it also has a complex life cycle. So part of it is benthic, but then part of its life stage is also pelagic, something you consider. So the crab fishery um, in Washington and Oregon is a state-run fishery. It's not a federal managed fishery, um, co-managed with the tribes. And so this is a figure from, um, from uh, Emily's upcoming paper. I should include that citation there, just detailing different decisions that the managers are making and the role for the seasonal forecasts in them. Um, and so, you know, in the fall, they start doing a test fishery. And then um, using that test fishery, they decide when the crab fishery will open and whether or not there'll be crab for Christmas. Um, and uh, the opening of the tribal fisheries in Washington happens first. Um, and then Washington, Oregon, uh, the state fisheries open after that. And so the, they're deciding about how to, where to open and how much to allocate um, together. Um, and then once the fisheries open um, in, the, in the summer then is when the hypoxia happens. And so um, that's when uh, the, the late summer is at the tail end of their fishery season uh, when they experience like closures potentially due to um, hypoxic conditions. Um, but then of course the fishers are also themselves making decisions about when and where to fish that fall along that time. So can we um, can these ocean conditions from JSCOP forecasts predict the spatial and temporal variability of the Dungeness crab catch? Um, this is something that Emily Norton has been working on, and she has a poster here that you can hear more about this um, by talking to her. Um, but she developed, as I'm leading with um, with Isaac, um, a, a model um, to look at the to model the Dungeness crab catch in the area. Um, and it's based on three different kinds of variables. One is like a static, which is mo mostly where the fishing behavior is, the static environmental conditions. There's a dynamic oceanography terms. Um, and then there's also um, the lagged conditions um, from, prior, uh, from prior times. And that's really supposed to mirror the, that complex life cycle. So um, it takes four years for the, um, the you know, larval stages to settle and develop into adults. Um, and so those lagged conditions are meant to represent that earlier life stage exposure. Okay. And so um, the model uh, does a really good job historically. Um, and so here's a, an example of that showing you um, observed CPUE in the solid lines and the, um, the predicted in the dashed. Um, so this is a, a combination of the static dynamic and lagged variables. Um, it certainly captures interannual variability in that downward trend that you see every year. Um, that's very sharp, you know, because a lot of the catch is happening right after the fishery is opened, right? Um, and she found that the ocean conditions are important drivers of that interannual variability in crab catch um, through a detailed analysis of figuring out, you know, which variables are more important, uh, which category of variables are important. Um, you can talk to her more about that. 
Um, and so because it does a good job, like I said in the past, including um, when we reforecast crab, crab catch spatially as well, um, but be, when we went forward to try and forecast it, um, the, because the, the observations we were using were logbook data from the fishery itself, um, the, in part, um, the for, forecast of fishing behavior appear to be necessary in order to provide true forecasts of crab catch. Um, so she can talk to you about that as well. She's got plots of the different kinds of fishery behavior we examined and thinking about that um, and trying to forecast that on seasonal timescales was not something we were set up to, to do um, prior to exploring this work. One product that we were able to co-design with the tribal and state fishers were, was this hypoxia forecast. Um, and so in particular, they wanted to see not the anomalies, but the actual threshold for hypoxia mapped, you know, like this. Um, and they decided on the color scale and asked us to include um, locations of assets and like names on the map, which, you know, social scientists have told me more recently, but wasn't something like place names and things like that, that I wasn't um, really thinking about in making, generating these, but um, working with stakeholders, uh, you learn that. Um, and so after five years of working with them, um, on this stuff, the management decision point where they came, the Cornell Indian Nation did take a management action um, based on a combination of observations and forecast models, both the live ocean, which is a short term, and the J-scope forecast for the region. And they closed their 28 fishery, 2018 fishery early because of hypoxia. Um, and, uh, and so that was the first time that we had seen a management action in response to our forecasts. Um, so, okay, so key takeaways um, from this are, are um, the, the forecast products that we work on from JSCOFE were co-developed with and used by the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife as well as the Quinault Indian Nation, um, as well as the NOAA Northwest Fisheries Science Center and Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Partners. But all those partners were there from the proposal stage at the ground level, like working with us. Um, and some people call it high touch, right? We meet with them many times a year and walk them through the, the, the delivery of the forecast, um, as well as other events that are going on, we end up talking about um, with them as well. Um, the predictability and performance testing suggest that our skill continues to be best in bottom conditions, and our preliminary results indicate mainly the, for biogeochemistry in terms of potentially only during the so neutral conditions, <coughs> and that's something to think about. Um, and so uh, the bottom conditions, um, including both temperature and saturation state are ones that fed into the crab model. So saturation state was something that was ended up um, being, being significant and included. Um, and uh, the JSCOPE you know, forecast of ocean conditions are already included in the ecosystem status report presented to the PFMC every year. Um, and the, those ocean conditions that are dynamic are clear to be important drivers of the interannual variability of crab catch, which was um, something that we learned through this exercise, which had been hypothesized before. Um, and the model does skillfully re-forecast those crab catch patterns in space and time. However, um, you know, improved forecasts of fishing behavior in particular are necessary um, to provide a true forecasts of crab catch moving forward. Um, and so, like, the main point is really that there's iterative collaborations, which Desiree also pointed to, um, and conversations with our regional managers um, can, can be used to develop these proactive strategies um, in, informed by robust science um, and that this is possible, you know, in order to implement to age management and sustaining marine resources moving forward. Um, with that, I'll just thank funding sources and put my contact information and happy to take questions the first time. observations you use for, uh, um, for, for initializing the model, for validating the model? Uh, yeah, so um, we, use, um, uh, we use whatever people will give us, honestly. <laughs> like, um, I'm a massive ingester of, of observations. When people have them, we try and bring them along you know, as much as we can. Um, and so this map shows a lot of them that are, but not all of those have biogeochemical data. 
Um, I will say all of the moorings that I talked about within the, which of which there are many in the, the sanctuary, um, are equipped with temperature, salinity, and oxygen at the bottom. So um, there is BGC information there. Uh, carbon is the mo definitely the most limiting, um, especially going back in time. And so uh, for going back further in time, we rely on these empirical models that are used on basic, um, were generated on basic hydrography, you know, um, that are out there in order to, you know, evaluate things going back in time. We also you developed our own version of those a long time ago to, to use for our boundary conditions and initial, initial states. Um, and so uh, those, um, those empirical relationships are important in both, both ways, really. And we have different empirical models that we use to initialize the other biogeochemical fields um, than, so each, you know, the oxygen in particular. Does that answer your questions, Mary? Thank you. Yeah, I, the real-time ones are really um, important, though, for the trust building because I, I tell people, like, you know, now, well, if you, you forecast it's going to rain, you go outside, you experience whether or not it's going to rain. Without the real-time of the oxygen, there's no way for people looking at these forecasts to know whether or not, it, you know, it really happened um, unless they're seeing the impacts of it, you know, on the beach. I said that was great. Um, I have a question. It's so interesting that your predictive skill for ENSO years is yeah. low. And this morning we were hearing for some variables in uh, Mike Jacobs's uh, analysis that the skill is higher in ENSO years. Um, and so I guess my question is um, what, do you think the bottom, uh, is there some relationship between the bottom fields that? Uh, your oxygen is sensitive to and the fields that he was showing that were not very well predicted that might help to explain that? Yeah, it's a really good question. This is the newest piece and that I haven't had a lot of time to dig into yet. Um, but I will say that the bottom temperature still remains strong. And I think if we made an apples to apples comparison where I averaged over the entire domain and looked at something a month lead time, two months, three months, you know what I mean, like the boxes that Mike showed us, that it might look more similar. The, the way I'm showing this here is is more diff, it is a harder test a little bit like than that it's spatial, like all that spatial information and point to point um, between the two. Uh, but it, that doesn't answer the biogeochemistry. So I think the temperature is the same, like meaning the bottom temperature remains strong during the ENSO years, even though uh, it's weaker than it is during the neutral years. Um, I don't think Mike looked at neutral years, and he's probably on the phone and can answer that question as himself. Um, but there are, uh, but there, there could be like some of the other um, conditions that he pointed to definitely could be culprits here in terms of contributing to it. Um, into, you know, why, because, yeah, there's, there's also a lot of work that's gone into historical characterization of La Nina and El Nino and how, when we know those states are different for pH and saturation state on the West Coast. Like, I didn't show that here, but there has been work done showing, like, that we know that there is a clear historical difference between those states, you know, and somehow that forecast, the forecast isn't capturing that. And it's interesting to me when we find this stuff, but it also means we have more work to do, yeah. Yeah. Very yeah, I just have a, a, a question about strong and so years. Which years? Yeah, so we use the ONI index and as a cutoff of 0.5. Uh, so their definition, you know, 0.5 is like a little bit above the median. It's, it's way more than a third. So you think we should change it to be Well, I mean, it's, it's their official and so definition. I don't think that's a bad number to use. Yeah. But I wouldn't call it a strong as we either. Okay. Yeah, I would just say it's the official definition of ENSO, which they need to do partly for non-scientific reasons. They need to pick that threshold. Yeah. And, and then kind of maybe related to this, and I'll just make a comment that I'd like to turn the name in the last month. Is predictability is not predictability. Great. It's not a measure of the skill, it's a measure of more of a theoretical yes. expected limit to skill, how the skill might vary in different circumstances. So I agree that yeah, going to stakeholders and saying this is how skillful it is useful, but 
technically it's not quite the same. They don't actually care as much about this as the science community does, right? Um, they care about that we understand the why, um, but that but they don't but they don't ask me to see this. Right. Predictability is more about understanding the why, but I, that's I'm not sure you're showing the why. Here. You're just showing more. Yes. We know in, in over a past period of time, which may be skewed by the fact that 2015 that was an atypical, and so with the tropical response. Yeah, we haven't gotten, you're right, I haven't answered the why. Yeah. Uh, it is something that I'm curious about, and in particular, how much that, um, what we know about the strong and so, I mean, it's, it's talked about all the time in this room, it's for seasonal predictability, right? That, that it's, that's connected in the West Coast, and dynamically, it's very much so true. But it's possible that the BGC may have other mechanisms that are not on that list that we're just starting to scratch the surface to explore. And that's really what this, I think, analysis shows, right? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm sorry, I don't want to truncate, this is exciting. Um, I'll just note that Mike, Mike Jacox um, mentioned that part of the difference in the period that Sam's looking at, that the predictability associated with ENSO is strongest in late winter, early spring, and in the summer, there's not so much. So Yeah, that's part of the reason why our January forecasts do better, right, than the, than the April. Thanks, that was good to That's fantastic. <laughs> Um, so next, um, we are going to get to hear a little bit from Clarissa. Sorry, I can't, I can't handle two things at once. Um, who's going to talk about how prediction? I, I wanted to check because I knew you should talk about so many things. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will trip. Um, okay, everybody, it's really fun being here um, to talk about halves. Hey, these are not the right slides. Can you talk about those? No. <laughs> <laughs> I could always throw mine up here. This is what happens when you send new versions while you're flying on an airplane. I knew, knew there was a highlight for of something like this happening. So, should we do No, I have a Sorry about this. Yeah. But also they don't, but I'm not sure that they have a protest everywhere. You know, they don't have 
So would you say that a lot of decision making is reactive as opposed to proactive? Fair enough. It struck me as a kind of a nice opportunity right? because ideally one would be able to, to give some advice as to which you know which activities to avoid or, or to pursue. Right? And so is, is that how is that how you're doing that too? Like the fact that the fishing behavior maps on the outcome in a meaningful way is it's kind of a nice, nice opportunity. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, we yeah, we have this kind of the fishing behavior map actually is a we also are worried, like, we want, we're also asking that maybe we get, and I think this is not unique, this ask. The um, friend would be able to say more, maybe, but like, it's a lot of this room, but um, like some fishery independent observations of biomass and seeing, like, co located with, um, co located with the ocean conditions seems also really critical if we're going to continue to try these avenues like this. And I think other fish stocks, you know, do have that, but in this case, for the state run fishery, you know, with the, the, that they don't, and maybe this is a new piece also a reason to prioritize that kind of as conservation of the gap and moving forward. Um, so, like, fully diagnose that because, you know, it's because we don't have an independent, right, to check on, um, on it. So, that, that, that's the hard part about, I think that, that it would be interesting to talk to you more about it. And, and be, um, <laughs> Sam, I think I know the answer to this question, but I want to make sure. Why does the Quinault close their crab fishery during that month? I didn't say that. That's a good new question. So, um, because they put crab pots out for now for like 30 days, they can leave them out for a long time, I guess. That's that for me when I say long time. Um, and when the crab pots are in the water and the pots conditions develop, the crabs can't escape those conditions. And we've seen videos from the um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife of the crab um, perishing because they're trapped within that. Whereas now they get to move. And the traps don't discern between juveniles or females or males, even though know, the fishery would never catch if they're too small or if they're, if they're female. So the fishery wants to making those kinds of decisions, right? But, um, but when they when they put them out, when there is the classification. So there are some groups working on like sensors for the traps, um, and of course these forecasts are another option there. That either the fishers can take an observation and look at a forecast beforehand, um, or the managers themselves can take this kind of action both during the time period. We know a lot about where it has to be built and when. Have the fishers considered or proposed to shortening the strike silk times for having a closing fishery outright? Yeah.
<laughs> All right, let's take two. Okay. All right, again, hello. Glad to be here talking about halves with the correct title this time. Um, so I'm going to kind of um, follow in Sam's footsteps. Thanks for setting me up nicely, Sam, with all the stakeholder discussions. We're going to get into what folks need when it comes to harmful algal bloom prediction on the West Coast, um, how we have ascertained that through uh, workshops and other means. And then um, part of what I'm, what I'm showing here on this first slide is that we've got a really robust modeling community on the West Coast, um, all of whom are collaborators in one way or another in what I'm going to talk about today. Um, on the right, a lot of our um, end users, partners, however you want to refer, usually these are folks we, we do very closely partner with in this space when it comes to harmful algal bloom prediction. Um, a lot of what I will talk about today is Pseudonychia and demoic acid, not all halves all the time. Um, we wish we could get there, but we're focused on certain things right now, particularly because of the Dungeness crab crisis that occurred in 2015. Um, another impetus for this talk is the coastal ocean modeling test bed uh, project that Chris Edwards leads um, that has been a driver for thinking through some of these problems. So um, this is that COMT project. I use COMT funds this, um, and it surrounds the issue that the West Coast Ocean or Operational <coughs> Forecast System has now become operational. We've had to think about what the impacts of that will be on a number of different ecological forecasts that rely in some way or another on some kind of a ROMS instance, um, real-time ROMS or otherwise, and um, what would be the ramifications for the biogeochemistry, the HAB prediction, the dynamic habitat modeling, a lot of the things that you've heard about today. Um, so as I talk about W costs, you'll know what I mean, um, and it is a West Coast-wide model. We've subset it. Uh, for California as I go ahead and talk about the HABs, um, but I want to point out that part of this Conti project um, is thinking about this stakeholder needs through the lens of the regional associations of IUPS, which is why um, I'm involved in the project um, for the most part, uh, Henry, Jan, so that's Skus, Senkus, and Nanus, and we have come together in collaboration in this project to think about the modeling. We already think a lot about the feedback loop between observations management of those observations, forecasts, and user products, and you heard a lot about that from Sam and how that works at Nanus. Um, so one of the things we did early on in this project was have a workshop at Ambari, and we brought 38-plus um, people into the room who represented different areas, different you know, sectors of different industries that might have a stake in something like a WCOFs model if it were to become operational. So at the time we started this, it hadn't quite transitioned. Um, so a couple of, you know, we went through these major components that were our project, which the observational impacts of the data simulation, the fisheries habitat um, component really centered around the ecocast model, ocean acidification and hypoxia, another one that centers around um, outputs from the UC Santa Cruz Nemuro coupling with ROMs, and then um, harmful algal blooms. We talked a lot about the harmful algal bloom stuff in the context of Sudnitchi and demoic acid, and, um, and the operational forecasts that are out there. So um, these are the outputs from that. We had quite a big we had a report, we had a spreadsheet with all of these things in it for our, our managers and folks at the NOAA end to be able to look back and see what is really needed, capture these user requirements. Um, so I don't have time today to go into these. You've, you've heard about the first three quite a bit. Um, I will focus on harmful algal blooms Today, and I'm just going to, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to step through these five um, points that came out of those discussions. Uh, and it's going to cross time and space scales, depending on that need. And it's not just going to focus on modeling. I'm going to talk about the full arsenal of things that we have um, in our toolbox to sort of throw at haves, have management, have prediction. Um, and so the first one I'll go into is the improved lead time thing. That really came down to what we found. We didn't have a lot of requests for seasonal outlooks on the HAB, in the HAB discussion. We had a lot of requests for now cast out to two week forecasts in terms of what is the sort of horizon um, over which a lot of people could respond and do something to mitigate. Um, tracking interstate trajectories that came up. Um, how do we look at what happens in California and whether that makes it to Washington, vice versa. Um, 
near shore impacts of HABs, this is a big one. This is one where I think we have a lot of work to do is getting our models into the estuaries and zones where most of this aquaculture and near shore um, shellfish growing is happening. Um, complexity in food web interactions and surface to benthic coupling. This one is still a huge challenge. Um, I'll talk about how we're trying to get there um, where people want to know when, when will those crabs get toxic? What animals will get toxic? As you probably are all aware, any given event can lead to toxins or not toxins. I have a you know, it's the, the actual impacts are shockingly disparate from one event to another. Um, and then predicting offshore bloom initiation, I'll end with that. Yes, so the arrows do sometimes work, and sometimes not. Um, all right, so for the first one, um, improving lead times. One thing we've been doing for a long time in California is just good old fashioned harmful algal bloom monitoring. Uh, we have a program we still sustain through SCUS and SUNCUS. This is weekly monitoring, um, just doing, having a human do the microscopy on a weekly basis, doing the toxin analysis, and also looking at full suite of variables that you can see there. We look at a suite of toxins, not just amoic acid. When we do this now, we're looking at nutrients. We're trying to um, quantify a lot of the ancillary variables that are going to drive HABs, and we're looking at um, a full suite of taxa as well. So in this particular instance, we are putting out weekly alerts of all of these groups that have the potential to cause harm, um, the potential to wreak havoc. They don't always wreak havoc, uh, which is part of the complexity of HABs. Um, and I'm just pointing out with each of these slides as I go through, I'm going to point out the limitations. Um, so in this case, some of the things you want to think about is that it is only a weekly snapshot of a very highly dynamic system. Very expensive to do this. If you weren't wanted to do it on a daily basis, um, we wouldn't have the ability to do that with the people power it requires. Um, and toxins and nutrients are not close to real time. We get that domoic acid turnaround, something on like uh, at best a week, at worst a month to two month basis. So that's not very helpful for end users. And people want uh, to be forewarned, ultimately. <clears throat> So another thing we're doing, and this is a, a new project that's being spun up, and it's um, a collaboration with a lot of folks in California. And this comes from California funding from the Ocean Protection Council, um, where we convinced the state somehow to buy a whole lot of these very expensive imaging flow cytobots. There already were some from research projects in the region, but we're now at almost um, 11 or 12, depend based on the leveraging that we're doing and the state input. So, um, it will be the biggest network anywhere. Gulf of Maine, of course, has a very nice network with Heidi being here, and we're collaborating with Heidi Sasek and Mike Brosnahan on another project that pulls all of these data into a very robust national data assembly center. That's a separate project that I'm not going into today. But this has a lot of power. It has power for modeling. The amount of data, every 30 minutes, we get a full resolution of the phytoplankton community through the images, apply the machine learning classifiers to those images, do all the um, facial recognition and, and start to populate a database with all of these plankton. Um, you're seeing an image there of a recent lingulodinium polyhedra bloom that we had. That's, that's the beautiful bioluminescent uh, dinoflagellate that you see a lot in Southern California. But here, while this is a very robust and expensive network that I think is fairly cutting edge, there's no toxic in information unless you pair this with an environmental sampling processor, which are even more <laughs> expensive. Um, users still need a reliable forecast in addition to, um, I think, kind of as Sam was saying, you get this real-time data, you can point to it in a validation sort of sense, but there's a lot of, that's a lot that's missing, and you're not getting the toxins out of this, which is a big problem. So um, starting back in 2004, this is well before we even um, kind of envisioned the, the Pacific Warm Anomaly blob crisis where HABs hit a fever pitch in California, everyone was clamoring for a model. Um, we were thinking about this, this is when I was a, a young grad student thinking about HAB prediction and started to put the pieces together that became what is the operational HAB model in California now. And so this was kind of just this Frankenstein approach of cobbling together what we could. We did a lot of statistical modeling and habitat suitability models, many of which of course required nutrients to get it right, but you could almost get it right if you took those out and just used what you can get from ocean color what you can get from a dynamic um, hydrodynamic circulation model. Um, we use DynEOF to fill in, interpolate the spaces in the satellite imagery so we have a nice seamless product, merge those together, um, and then at the, at the kind of pixel level, then apply the um, habitat models to that. And then we did this specifically to get at domoic acid. Sudanichi was part of it, 
but it's not a rules-based approach. You don't have to have Sudnichi in the water to have the toxins. We were really just modeling, focused on modeling the toxin because there are very few models that actually get to the heart of the matter when it comes to HABs. Usually it's just chlorophyll, sometimes it's a species of interest, um, but this was a many year, multi, you know, 15 year process of sort of stepping through this and then working with NASA to cross the valley of death um, and identify an end user, which ended up being Coast Watch to take this on and run it operationally. So it's now considered an operational model, whatever that means um, in NOS. And I'll go into all the different components that go into this in a minute because we do make a bulletin that comes out of this. But there's, there is a daily now cast and three-day forecast. And the three-day forecast is really just based on a simple advection scheme, sort of pushing those pixels forward using the, uh, pr the, the predicted um, surface current vectors. So there's a lot of players, as you can see, this was, um, there are a lot of layers, there are a lot of things required to demonstrate operationalization, et cetera. Um, so this is what that looks like. I just pulled an image now. We, this goes out on Coastwatch ERDAP, the NOAA ERDAP, but we also use it, we ingest it, SCUS and SUNCUS into our portals. We now have a joint portal, which I'm sort of sharing with you here a little prematurely, um, where you can layer any kind, anything that's in our catalog, you could layer in with those, those projections. And what you're seeing here is just a now cast of the probability of a domoic acid event, so it's over a particular threshold. Um, and then in this, in this plot, I just pulled down the crab pot locations to show you how you might be able to overlay um, any number of parameters, but we have shore station data, we have lots of different kinds of offshore data, um, radar, you name it. So this is great because you get that forecast. It's only for one group though, it's only for one toxin, um, which is a deadly neurotoxin and it is a big problem on the West Coast. Uh, and so accuracy, you know, I'm not gonna go into all of the skill assessment we did, which often did require just pixel level matchups with what we have at peers, um, very limited observational data with which to do a robust skill assessment or get capture uncertainty. It's missing biogeochemistry. Again, like I said, this was the, the best thing we could do at the time to get an operational model. So it's ocean color. So it's a, several different bands where we t I take, used to take the water leaving radiance and just do that, um, do that processing myself. Um, now Coastwatch does it. And there's no food web prediction. So you get this in water prediction. And then what does an end user do with it? Most of them really don't care so much about how much demoic acid is in the water or in a cell. They really want to know whether it's going to impact um, the animal that they care about, whether that's humans, marine mammals, et cetera. Um, so with the Conti project, we're looking at that, the impacts of WCOFs, as I said. One of the things we do is look at the impacts with, with sea harm, um, some sensitivity analyses kind of thing. Right now it relies on one version that we call the California three kilometer ROMs that we're now calling classic. Um, it's getting deprecated as WCOFs moves in, looking at what does that mean. Um, but in terms of the users really wanting to track interstate trajectories, there is potential power here with this full West Coast domain to start to make sea harm um, on the, along the, the West Coast, not just subsetting to California. Um, problems there, though, it, it doesn't really solve your spatial resolution problems because this is a four kilometer model when we've been using is three kilometers. Um, we have no parameterization for sea harm in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it would be very expensive to run the DynEOF part of this for the entire domain. Um, and there would be a lot of temporal gaps because um, we're limited in terms of how we can do satellite work in the Pacific Northwest. This thing is finicky. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so I was referring to the bulletin earlier, um, and I think this, this is where we've tried to think about uncertainty translation for the user community. Um, when we put the CHARM model out there, great, this, this looks nice, pretty pictures, spatially explicit model, all that kind of thing, but it was definitely a struggle to um, gain the trust that Sam was talking about uh, we don't have to convince the state to make real decisions off of it, but we do want them to see it as a tool that helps them guide sampling when they have to go out and sample. Because um, the, their, their legal mandate is to sample the, shell, the commercial shellfish. Everything else is, really comes down to an advisory, even Dungeness crab or any other fish 
it's more of an advisory and there's no real um, like laws in place to, to monitor those for algal toxins. Uh, so we work with the state, um, all the marine mammal groups, in the entire state of California, we work with on a monthly basis to get their stranding data for any animal that's stranded from domoic acid toxicosis or, or was likely to have. Um, we plot those for them. We create climatologies of the marine mammal strandings, um, plot all, that, all the HABs data that we collect, all the HABs data that the California Department of Public Health collects, and then really this comes down to, to me because we're a small group at SCOOS is just writing that synthesis for them and explaining how the model matched up relative to all of these resources. There was a closure here in Humboldt, but the model said this and the sampling said this. We often see the marine mammals will strand um, and are a great sentinel related to the model because the model is capturing this real synoptic offshore variability in HABs that, and you see a huge disconnect or decoupling between what's happening at our peers through HAB map will show one version of a story. Uh, sea harm will show another version, um, and often the mammals will match with sea harm, but they won't match with what's happening at the piers. So that mismatch has been a constant battle in um, harmful algal bloom forecasting because nearshore and offshore environments can be really different. So as you think about uh, that nearshore component and how all of the major aquaculture operations in California are happening in these estuary or very enclosed regions of the coast. Um, we, are fo we were focused for a while on how sea harm was doing at predicting that toxicity. Um, we got a lot of feedback that we needed to go in that direction. Um, and so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about a very small project that we did that I would hope, hope to do more of, um, where as part of the NASA funding that was funding sea harm, we got a little bit more money to work with um, a high resolution model of the Humboldt Bay where there is a major oyster growing uh, operation. Strangely enough, um, it doesn't seem to deal with the domoic acid problem very much in the oysters. Um, we wanted to see if that was, what that was, what was constraining that to some degree. So by linking sea harm as kind of a boundary condition to this high resolution Humboldt Bay model, we were able to then do some particle tracer tracking experiments to see what is the likelihood of getting up into these? So this is kind of the, the coastal boundary for sea harm on the left, and then trying to get up into the upper bay where a lot of the shellfish growing is happening up here. Um, how can we even feasibly get a domoic acid problem there if you had a high, let's say, concentration of domoic acid on the coast? Of course, this is just a passive tracer experiment, um, but what we did see, um, these are the different, the colors represent the different parts of the bay, um, and it's up in that northern part of the bay where um, the problem really was. So up here, where we're starting to see a lot of the shellfish growing. Um, and we, we really noticed there with the results of this is that there's nothing really preventing domoic acid from being a problem. There may be residence time issues there. We're not sure why the oysters don't seem to pick it up. But then I don't have it here, but we then started um, just ad hoc measuring weekly with the shellfish growers, having them send samples, doing the toxin measurements, started to see some of the highest toxins we've ever seen in California in the upper reaches of the Humboldt Bay. And yet these oysters are never you know, getting toxic. There's a lot more modeling we could be doing to interrogate this. Um, but what we did so far lacks any mechanism. It's not, has no operational components, no real biology. But um, there are some mysteries that, we're, that are yet to unravel, and we're still continuing to sample up there and seeing very high, somewhat ephemeral, but very high concentrations of domoic acid. Uh, on the machine learning side and thinking about getting into the food web, um, I've been working with a group, and this was left, led by Chris Free, who is at UC Santa Barbara, thinking about taking the CHAR map output, which we now have many, many years of, looking at that time series relative to the time series of domoic acid in these very important fisheries like Dungeness crab, rock crab, spiny lobster. And so kind of constraining that relationship using um, various machine learning models. And um, I was really struck by the outcome of that, doing a really good job, I would say, getting in sort of that 70, 80% accuracy kind of realm of predicting when those organisms might become toxic. So, um, you know, we went through the Hubmuller diagram is showing you latitudinally those responses, 
The lines represent closure thresholds for a given fishery. Um, we have yet to get this out there, but I think it's really promising. It's another one of these, um, what can you do in the here and now, very practical, lacks mechanism, lacks true dynamic understanding, but yet um, could be really useful to stakeholders. Another modeling exercise we're going through with the food web interactions is to think mechanistically about domoic acid production, taking what we do know from the statistical and empirical models, where nutrient ratios like the silicic acid to nitrate ratio have proven to be very important for turning on domoic acid production in Sudanitia. Um, and this is work um, I started years ago at UC Santa Cruz with Chris Edwards and Rafe Kudella, and we've spun it into um, into a project where we took this zero D mechanistic um, idea of how domoic acid may or may not be produced, tested it against batch and chemostat cultures, and now we're working on a project with the UCLA team to um, embed that in a ROM spec coupled model and start to look at the 3D runs in a hindcast mode and, and relate that to known domoic acid events. I think this has a lot of promise for all kinds of interaction work benthic coupling, um, OAH interactions, and the like. But it's not operational yet, um, and, the, and the food web is limited. So I just have two more slides. This one is exciting work. I'm not sure yet how we're gonna use it, but another thing that was spun up with a colleague um, years ago, thinking about the use of stable isotopes, the analysis at the compound-specific level of amino acids, domoic acid is an amino acid, might not realize it's not, you know, that's why it's called that, but it's, there's a lot of similarities between domoic acid and these amino acids we use to trace food webs, understand the size of food webs, their placement, where an animal feeds and how, where it feeds geographically, latitudinally and longitudinally. And we're starting to see some super interesting um, relationships when we compare a really high domoic acid year with a low domoic acid year. Uh, because I'm limited for time, I'll just talk about the plot on the right where it looks like, um, I think I have a little call out here in green, these anchovies, which are represented here in this del N15 phenylalanine, what they're showing you is that they have really low del N values for phenylalanine. This is a sign that even this was the 2015 bloom, water, waters were warm. This really corroborates things that Andrew Thompson and others are think, seeing at Southwest Fisheries where these were subarctic waters. So that codes, that's a tracer for subarctic waters. So these anchovy were coming in, very high in domoic acid, coming into the system, um, and they were coming from cold water regimes. So we're starting to look at the two things and start to put together a picture of how a massive event like that works. It doesn't mean that the system isn't productive, it is. Um, and it also means that there's animals coming from strange places. and. Um, it's been really cool. I'd like to go into this more, but maybe we can talk about it more. I just don't know yet how to incorporate this sort of information into the models. And then the last thing we're doing is looking at offshore initiation of these blooms um, using long-range AUVs, putting different kinds of sensors on them to interrogate the omics because a team at Scripps has finally kind of broken down the biosynthetic pathway for domoic acid production, and this now allows us to do true transcriptomics for DA. So we're doing this to look at offshore initiation at three different sites in Northern California from south to north, and hopefully this kind of information in the long run will feed back and validate models like ROMSPEC. Um, I'm just not sure yet um, how that's gonna get incorporated, but I think that's sort of the strategy when we think about omics and how it could work for modeling. So my last slide just gives you my impressions. I started out by saying, um, you know, people might always get what they want, but sometimes they do get what they need in terms of the utility, the usefulness, of a model, it's not always perfect, it doesn't always get you everything, but people want to have the best model they can get. Um, you can read through all of the points I made, but I think the last one I wanna say is that co-production is really great and you need that to know what kind of products and synthesis and interpretation to give folks, but I think that in the end, our modeling strategies always just come down to the science, leaning into things that we people might not need right now, but they're gonna need later, and we need to think about the R&D and the science and not just what does somebody need right now, because it does change, and they don't always anticipate those changes. Okay, thank you, and I'll take questions. So I'm super sorry. Can we hold questions until the discussion period? Because we will have um, a chance to do that. And um, we're, we'll just, since we have our um, online audience, we have to try and stay a little bit um, on schedule. So. 
Our next speaker is rushing to the front. Um, uh, <laughs> Margie is going to talk about ecological applications in Chesapeake Bay. I mean, to, to, oh, this? You want to see an arrow? Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so today I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about um, various different uh, forecasting, ecological forecasting applications in Chesapeake Bay. So we heard a couple of uh, different um, fisheries and acidification, various different halves, and now we're going to look at kind of all of these things in just one region, the Chesapeake Bay. So over here on the right is a map of the bay. Um, I like to use an arrow, see if I can make it that work. The Delaware Bay up here, this is the Chesapeake Bay. Down here, this is Yellow Star, this is where I work at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Um, yeah, and so, and I, I just want to start off by a, with a caveat that in this presentation, I'm really going to uh, stress pretty much just for ease of getting this done at the last minute, uh, work that's modeling work that's been done in our own lab. But there is a lot of great Chesapeake Bay modeling work that's been done uh, by others. And, and so I just wanted to put that apology out there right, right up front. So uh, since this is all Chesapeake Bay focused, I just thought I would give you a little background on the bay. Um, so this is the largest, the Chesapeake Bay is the, the largest estuary in the U.S. Or the, or the continental U.S. There's always a debate whether the Cook Inlet really counts or not. Um, it also has a, a very long coastline. I've heard it said that the coastline of the bay is the same as the whole, or roughly equal to the whole west coast. So it has a very long coastline uh, and very uh, densely populated. So we've got a population in the watershed of uh, 18 million, incorporating six states and uh, Washington, D.C., uh, and also, it's, it's in, the bay is economically very important for the region. Ecosystem services derived from the bay have been estimated to be more than $100 billion annually, and this includes many, many different fisheries, um, striped bass, menhaden, a, a, a burgeoning new uh, shellfish aquaculture industry, and then also, of course, tourism and, and lots of other things as well. So, unfortunately, in past, over the past years, it doesn't switch when I want it to. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Okay. Uh, sure, stand away. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, in, in uh, past decades, there have been numerous uh, anthropogenic impacts on the bay. Um, and so over, since the 1950s, uh, nitrate inputs have doubled to the bay. This has caused an increase in hypoxia of, of more than a factor of three. And then we've got uh, pH and omega both decreasing, not only from atmospheric increases in, in atmospheric CO2, but also these changes in nutrient inputs as well. And in order to um, uh, deal with all these anthropogenic impacts, the, the, the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership has been developed uh, many decades ago, and it's really uh, there to, to lead uh, and direct uh, re the restoration of the bay. And this includes federal agencies, most notably NOAA and EPA, as well as the six states and, and DC as well. There, click, okay. Um, so, not perhaps uh, not surprisingly, um, given all of the, the ecosystem services of the bay and, and, and as well as the anthropogenic impacts, um, there there many folks are, are stakeholders or and managers are interested in a variety of of, ti of forecasting over a variety of timescales in the bay, uh, and so here I've, I've outlined. Um, basically three different time scales of forecast, daily, weekly forecast, seasonal forecast, and mid-century projections. And these are all of interest in the Bay. So for example, on, on short-term daily, weekly forecasts, we have charter boat captains and anglers. They, they want to know where they can fish in the Bay. They want to know where the hypoxia is. Turns out the fish kind of congregate at that uh, oxygen at three milligram per liter area. So they really uh, want to know where they can bring clients to, to, to catch their fish. Um, the aquaculture industry and hatcheries really want to know whether they need to, specifically the hatcheries, whether they need to treat the bay intake water or if, it, if it's particularly low in, in pH and aragonite saturation state. 
And then beach managers, as well as uh, folks, just the public who go to the beach, want to make sure that the beaches, the water there is swimmable and it's safe from haves and, and vibrio and other things. So these four, these folks uh, are, are really interested in, in days up to, up to maybe a week. Um, and then on the longer time scales, uh, seasonal forecasts, lots of, of folks are, are interested in those forecasts as well. Uh, particularly the public, those always get when you have a seasonal forecast in the, in the spring of what the summer holds, folks always uh, um, in, in really are, are keyed in. They want to know what the summer is going to be like. Um, but, but also uh, fisheries managers really need this uh, longer term uh, time scales for, for catch limits, for example. And then finally, we have even longer uh, mid inter interannual, interdecadal, mid-century projections. And here we've got uh, coastal resource managers that are really interested in this information. Um, they want to know whether their, their planned nutrient reduction, so we, what we call the total maximum daily loads, or TMDLs, are going to lead to attaining that, that water quality um, that, that we had hoped it would when these TMDLs were set decades ago, in spite of climate change, which we now know is, is affecting the Bay uh, tremendously. So um, today I'm really going to, I don't have time definitely to talk about all of these. I'm really just going to focus on the, the shortest time scales and the, the longer projections. Uh, but a lot of great work has done, been gone on, uh, done on the, the seasonal forecast. So I want to just highlight this particular paper by uh, Don Scabia et al. Uh, that recently came out uh, in ecological application. So this is a great place to, to learn about some of the empirical models, or an example of an empirical model that's, that's being used to uh, uh, assess, uh, do um, seasonal hypoxia forecast for the day. So I'm going to start off by on the short time scales. Um, and for this, we've developed uh, what we call CBEFs, our Chesapeake Bay Environmental Forecast System. And I just uh, want to uh, highlight over here um, uh, three folks that have been inherently involved in this. Aaron Beaver for Anchor, from Anchor QEA has really, really manages the system, uh, and he is, is online here. Um, Pierre, I, I believe, and uh, Pierre St. Laurent from uh, VIMS is really uh, one of the, the core developers of the model. Um, and I believe he's uh, attending too virtually. And then Raleigh Hood has been involved from the very beginning uh, in helping us set up this uh, system as well. Uh, and then we've got uh, two papers, one by Aaron, one by Pierre, and I have the, the, the citations down at the bottom here. So basically the, the Estrin model is, um, just to give you a, a general feel for the model, the, the grid is here in the center. Um, yeah. Oh, there's my mouse. Okay, this is the, the model grid. The uh, resolution is about 600 meters by 600 meters. We've got 20 vertical levels. This includes full hydrodynamics, tides, and, and carbon, nitrogen, carbonate cycling, all of this is in there. Um, but of course, the model is only as good as the forcing we give it. So we need forcing both from the atmosphere, from the land, and from the ocean. So in terms of atmospheric forcing, basically here we're, think we're, we're forcing it with our weather forecast. So um, you know, wind forecast, temperature forecast, precipitation, solar radiation, all of this feeds right into the model. Uh, from the land, we use uh, terrestrial inputs uh, from watershed models, so including the, the Bay Program's official uh, watershed model, as well as USGS gauge data, too. And then on the ocean uh, boundary, we typically use long-term climatological inputs, uh, but sometimes we also link to uh, coastal models or if we're working towards that way. So this is uh, the, the model system, but of course, none of this would be possible if we didn't have all the data we have in the, in the Chesapeake Bay. So I know we're really lucky, I, I hate to say it, but we are really, really lucky to have all this data. We've got uh, 35 years of data, 17 cruises a year, more than 100 stations, um, and with depth of temperature, temperature, salinity, oxygen, pH, and then bottle samples for nutrients and, and chlorophyll. Uh, and on top of that regular sampling program, we've got buoys and uh, data flow, con continuous monitoring stations, and of course the, the river uh, gauge data as well. So this, of course, is really the backbone of the model. This is, this is what we've used to develop the model um, over, over many years. So we've got these uh, inputs, um, the, the atmospheric coastal land inputs, and we are evaluating the, the model with the, the, the data I just showed. And with all this, this basically feeds into our real-time model forecast uh, setup. So every night we have the setup so that it all runs automatically and we get now casts and two-day forecasts um, produced and they are displayed every, every day on our website there, www.bims.edu slash cbefs, C-B-E-F-S. So 
if you're re if you get are on your phone, I am assuming that you are, are going to go take a look at the website. Please do. <laughs> Everyone get out their phone and start texting them. No. Uh, so, yeah, so they're, they're all displayed there. And then the idea here is that it's really, um, we've worked hard to get it to be mobile friendly so that folks on, the, um, on their, on their uh, ships and uh, can, can, on the, the fishing boats can, can easily uh, look at our, our, our forecasts. So additionally, we are also uh, working with Maracuse, our, our IU's regional association, and, and the forecasts are also there um, in, in much more depth in, on their oceans map portal, and there you can do fancy things and zoom in and out and model data comparisons and, and also download all of our net CDF uh, data if, if anyone wants to play around with it. Um, so we find that these two different portals are, are really kind of serve different audiences, different purposes. Um, so are, are both useful places that you can go. So if you if you take a look uh, and, and go to that website, you'll see something like this on the right. Um, and if you go on your laptop, you'll see something that looks more like this. Um, but I just wanted to, on the, the right here, uh, mention the different things that you can't read over there. We're, we are forecasting uh, hypoxia and also the, the dead zone size, essentially. Uh, various different uh, acidification metrics, pH, saturation state, alkalinity. Uh, we have Vibrio forecasts up there, as well as temperature and salinity, and we've got um, some HABs forecast, um, forecasts coming soon. So I just will show you a little bit of uh, a few maps. This is what was I, I downloaded um, a, a day or two ago. Um, so this is what uh, bottom oxygen looks like on the bay, what was forecast to look like at the, at, on the bottom of the bay today. So um, all blue, that means healthy, healthy water at this time of year. No, no problems out there yet. Hypoxia here is a completely a, a summer phenomenon. If you saw yellow and green, you'd be moderate, uh, moderately low oxygen, red, very low bottom oxygen. Um, whoops, sorry. So more interesting time of the year, this is an example of what it would look like in the middle of uh, July. This is from July 8th, last summer. Uh, so you can see the, the, what, what folks call the dead zone, uh, this hypoxic region of water being the, the red stretching through. Um, through. Yeah, I, I can give up on the arrow, sorry. <laughs> um, the, the, the through down through Maryland. Um, and up into the, the Potomac as well. So in addition to hypoxia, we also um, have forecasts there on bottom pH. So here on the left is an example of um, bottom pH. And on the right, surface aragonite saturation state, just kind of to show you the, the kinds of things we have on there. Uh, and the newest thing we've added is the, the percent chance of encountering Vibrio. So this was our, our forecast again for today. And here the blues represent very low chance. So if you're swimming in the bay today, you've got very low chance of encountering uh, Vibrio. Um, but of course, that's not always the case. So it's clearly not a concern this time of year. But in the summer, it, it, it really can be. And so here you can see in the, the central bay where, where the higher, uh, much higher chances, uh, 70 to 100% uh, chance of encountering Vibrio there. Um, and then in addition, we have uh, a time series of um, the, the, the percent of the bay with a, with a high chance of Vibrio encounter. So here the blue represents a 50% chance and the red the 70% uh, chance. So again, you can see this is just really a summer phenomenon with um, very 0% chance at, at other times of the year, for instance, right now. Um, and so we talked about uh, Vibrio, and I just wanted to say that, have, again, as I mentioned earlier, have forecasts are going to be coming soon, and, and Dante Horman is our uh, new postdoc working on this, and he has, ah, it's his spotlight talk tomorrow. Well, I wrote this yesterday. It was tomorrow, <laughs> but now it's going to be today. <laughs> I wrote it late last night. Okay, so yes, yeah, so stay tuned, and, and you'll hear a little bit more about what we're doing in terms of HABs. Okay, so, so that's, an, and I did want to just emphasize again that, that a lot of this has been driven, like, like the other speakers have said, really driven uh, from my uh, back and forth communication with the stakeholders. And, and I really didn't uh, put that into these slides too much, but really we've had uh, workshop and focus groups. We've got two extension uh, specialists, one on acidification and then one on uh, uh, more the, the angle, one more on, on um, hatcheries and uh, shellfish, and one more on fin fish and recreational fisheries. Uh, and we've been working very closely with them to really get feedback. And so the, the maps that you see are here based on uh, actually many years of, of working with the stakeholders to try and see what they, what they, what they want. Um, yeah, okay, so now I'm gonna transition into much longer uh, mid-century 
projections. And here I'm going to uh, highlight um, uh, some, some results from, from a couple of my students. This is work by Kyle Hinson. Um, and, and we have a project working with some of the managers. And, and basically we found that they, what they really want to know is how climate change impacts on the watershed, so increasing atmospheric temperature and, and increasing the number of storms, how that's going to affect the runoff, because they're really keyed in on, on reducing nutrient runoff. So they want to know how climate change is going to affect that runoff and then how that is going to affect hypoxia. And secondly, they want to know con the, how, how confident we are in these estimates. So uh, we've talked a lot about um, uncertainty quantification here, and, and that they, they tell us right off the bat, we do not want to hear about uncertainty. We want to hear about confidence. So anyway, we've learned, we've changed the question. We want to know how confident are we in these, in these estimates, at least when we talk to them. I think I can say uncertainty here. Um, and so what Kyle is doing, has, has done here is, is try to answer this question. And so he's done this through a very a complex um, system he set up here. He's looking at five different uh, global climate models. I really need an arrow. There we go. Five different climate models. He's using these are, uh, he's applying two different downscaling methods to these five different climate models. These produce different estimates of temperature and precipitation, which are then fed into two different watershed models. So then we get different the, the various different uh, discharge and nutrient loads, which are then in, fed into our uh, estuarine model that I was just talking to you about, and ultimately to produce um, hypoxia forecasts. So we're trying to kind of get an ensemble of results here to, to get at that uncertainty uh, question. Uh, so ultimately, he's got basically this uh, simplified here, 20 climate scenarios. So again, five GCMs, two uh, downscaling techniques, and two watershed models lead to 20 different scenarios, all run through our uh, uh, hypoxia model. Um, so the, the, here are just, um, let's look just for a second at just the five different GCMs. So he's picked, uh, we have actually 20, we picked the, he picked the centroid. Uh, a, a cold, dry, warm, wet, warm, dry, cold, wet model. So we've got these five models. He, he runs all of them. Um, and, and for one particular watershed model and one particular downscaling technique and runs these all through. And this is showing here the change in annual hypoxic volume between the 2050s and the 1990s. So um, ultimately, overall, uh, well, you can see an, an, an increase of uh, maybe five to uh, t minus five to two plus 25% chance for these, this, these five climate scenarios. Now, if we look at all 20 climate scenarios using the different, uh, the different um, downscaling techniques and the, the two different watershed models, basically 80% of the climate scenarios are, are projecting an, an increase in, in hypoxia in the future. So, so that's the, the, we find that the managers really want to know, actually want to know a number. Um, they want some kind of, of confidence estimate. So we were also interested, and, and they were interested in, in what is causing this, this uncertainty. Um, and so what, what Kyle found was basically, it, it's amazingly similar between these three sources. So of course, again, we're looking at these three different sources of uncertainty, the global climate model, the watershed model, and the downscaling method. You know, so 40, 32, 28, overall take home messages. These are all really important. And I think we were perhaps most surprised about the downscaling technique is really almost as introduces almost as much uncertainty as the, the global climate model. Okay, so I know I'm going through this. Hopefully that paper will be out soon and you can look at all the, the more detailed analysis there. I also have another student, Colin Hawes, that, that's um, also working, trying to, to work with managers and, and try to use our modeling system to answer some of the questions that they have. And so he's, um, one of the, the questions that we were asked was how does, this impact of changing runoff on hypoxia compared to other direct effects of changing atmospheric conditions. So again, what I just talked about was the impact of the air temperature change on the watershed impacting hypoxia. But how does the actual changes in air temperature impact hypoxia? And where in the bay are these the greatest effects going to be seen? Um, and so here he's, he's done a number of different uh, scenarios trying to tease apart all of the different aspects of climate change. So here he is looking at the change in, in bottom oxygen um, from between, again, between the 2050s and the 1990s over the, this is a climatological, so the average of five years here um, on the month on the x-axis. And the black line represents all these different climate uh, change impacts at the same time. Green is just the impact of air temperature change, wind change, 
blue is precipitation, solar radiation, and, and this yellow here is, is basically what we just looked at, is, it, it is the impact of, of changing runoff uh, due to climate change. Um, and so the take home message here is really that the direct impacts of atmospheric change on the Bay are actually much greater than the indirect impacts uh, that occur from uh, the changing runoff due to climate change. And this is just shown in another way here, um, where these various different bars, again, the, the green bar representing the atmospheric temperature change. And that's really what's, what's changing hypoxia and, and oxygen concentration in the, in the future. So where is this occurring finally? So here are a couple maps in the, the far left here. This, these are results from 19, uh, the basically our baseline simulation from the 90s. In the center, are the 2050s. And then on the right is the difference. So you can see that the biggest uh, change is really in the central bay here with slightly less changes uh, in, the, in the north and the south. Um, so anyway, just to, this is my final slide, just to, to conclude here. Um, you're asked to, to think about different time scales of time horizons of interest um, and, and which are of most interest in the Chesapeake Bay. And it's really hard to say because this really depends on the stakeholders. And there are there is interest pretty much, a, you, you name a time scale and someone is interested in it. Uh, very different applications, of course, the daily being uh, public going to the beach and the anglers fishing, uh, seasonal, maybe more fish, fisheries managers, and then the, the coastal resource managers will be more on the, on the longer time scales. I didn't hear today, I really just focused on our, our mechanistic modeling, but again, we're, we're working and others are working a lot on empirical modeling and machine learning, and there's a lot of great opportunities there um, as well for, for some, some, some applications, um, particularly potentially the, the short-term habitat suitability models and short-term models. Um, and what data and inputs are needed? What do we need most? This is, I think, is one of the... the um, uh, question, breakout questions that we're going to be going off to next. Um, I would say it's one of the, our perennial issue is, is our, again, our, our model is only as good as, as what we have driving it. And this largely comes from the, from the land. What are the, what are the nutrients coming off the land? And that's something that we're continually, we've got a lot of data, got the USGS great, gauges are great, but we need, um, you know, they don't give us all the information we need. Um, and then in the atmosphere, of course, we need higher resolution uh, weather forecasts would be great. Um, we we uh, can't go out, you know, wind forecasts are, may only be good for 10 days into the future, so we're not going to be able to predict farther because the hypoxia is so dependent on those winds. Um, and then downscaling, and, and downscaling is, is, a, uh, is, is something that uh, clearly at this, these scales is, is incredibly important, and we need some uh, further research as well. So I will end there. I think we're too much. <laughs> nicely some of the questions that Clarissa raised between the open ocean to the near shore pier challenges, right? I mean, these are all the pieces that come in to play in the near shore. I'm sorry. Everybody here needs a break. I need a bathroom <laughs> So um, can we hold, write your questions for Margie down so that we can bring them up in the discussion after the spotlight talks, please, because don't forget them. Yeah, no, actually, no, 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 no,